Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Grassman. In the South, they call it Skunk Ape, Wood Booger, or Rougarou. And across the globe, Yeti, Yowie, and Yaren, to name a few. More than 30 Native American tribes have a name for the beast. Some as endearing as Big Brother, or as ominous as Boss of the Mountain. They've been depicted on the walls of caves for centuries. To date, there are over 11,000 reported sightings of these creatures in North America alone. There is an abundance of physical, empirical, and anecdotal evidence supporting the existence of these seemingly human primates, yet it is still considered a myth. Our focus is not to research or try to prove Bigfoot exists, but to document the findings and experiences of Bigfoot researchers and everyday people like ourselves. Joined by my wife and co-host Linda, we will travel the country interviewing, taking expedition, and visiting the locations where their Bigfoot odyssey began bringing to you their means, observations, and interactions with the man-like beast known as Bigfoot. I'm Kerry Arnold, and this is Bigfoot Odyssey. On this episode of Bigfoot Odyssey, we're in breezy southeast Oklahoma. We're with Mark Copeland. Now his Bigfoot Odyssey has been an emotional upheaval. From the revelation of discovering the presence of Sasquatch on his property and the fear of uncertainty involved in that prospect to the heavy-hearted responsibility of doing what he feels is best for his family and leaving this place altogether. Hope everyone enjoys the show. Where, where were you about this creature before you had any awareness at all? Um, like it falls inside the same um, category for me as uh, Greek mythology or Santa Claus or something like that. I never, it was just, you know, it was folklore. You hear the Indians talk about it and things like that, but you hear the Indians talk about, you know, their, their folklore around a lot of other things that doesn't sound believable. Sasquatch was just one of them. Uh, where we come from, down in Arkansas, where the, uh, you know, the Delta area, you don't hear stuff about Bigfoot down there. It's not the northern part of Arkansas. And when we came here, my my parents were like, we ought to take the kids down to the Bigfoot Festival or something. It's this weekend, and I just I really laughed it off. I'm like, you know, it's ridiculous. You know, there's no way there's an upright bipedal creature running through these woods with the technology, with the you know population expansion, and uh, everybody's got a camera, and it's remaining undetected. It seemed completely impossible to me, and uh, it was just uh, it's just folklore stuff. It was no different than than Santa Claus for the Easter Bunny, as far as I was concerned. And I never really give it much thought, much consideration. And, you know, there have been things that have happened, well, shortly within two months of us first moving here, almost five years ago, uh, that when my son had his experience on November the 10th, uh, 2019, there was a flood of memories and, and stuff that had happened over the years that we've been here that I realized that there was probably more to those events than what I had uh, given, you know, thought to. And uh, my son on uh, November 10th come inside the uh, the bedroom over at our house over here and uh, he said, Dad, Dad, he was frantic about it. He said, Dad, there's a bear outside, it has a white face and it was looking at me. And uh, I, there were some details in his, in that short conversation we had because I really didn't want to ask him much questions. I wanted him to tell me in his own words what he saw. The only question I asked was, how was it walking? Was it walking like the horses and the dogs? He said, no, it was walking like me and you, Dad, and there was two of them. And that was all I needed. I got my AR-15 out from underneath the bed, took it out of the case. I was outside inside the yard looking, you know, for what he saw. I never saw anything, uh, but I knew that he had saw something, and it wasn't until I started looking into some of the details that he gave me in that short two sentences he gave, the white face, and there was two of them, that I realized that there's several people talk about how they traveled in pairs, and uh, I found a video on his website where he shows one with a white face, or a gray face, depending on how people look at it, and uh, man, it become real. 
it, I, I firmly believed that my son had an experience. And I had never given it consideration, considering some of the things that had happened in the previous years that I completely blew off the children's overactive imaginations or watching too much television. I have a nine-year-old uh, named Trevor who, uh, you know, was riding his go-kart one day, and he said, well, they can't catch me now. And my wife said, what are you talking about? They can't catch you now. In his exact words, I'll never forget it. There's a man that lives in the woods. He comes to my window at night and watches me while I sleep. And I completely blew that off as overactive imagination or something on uh, TV or YouTube that he saw that spooked him and and and, uh, and, and got into his mind. Just like whenever I was a kid and I watched a uh, creature from the Blue Lagoon and I was afraid to go out and do the swimming in the river after that. And, uh, you know, just stuff gets in kids' minds and that's what I was thinking it was. We never asked him any questions about it, because it, it was so, it, looking back now, it was something so significant, but it was just treated as something as just like a, you know, a comment that, in passing, you know, their bedroom was on this side of our house over here. I don't know how he knew that this man lived in the woods. I don't know if he saw him coming out of the woods or whatever like that, but apparently, just by listening to him, he talks about man lives in the woods he comes to my window at night and watches me while i sleep this is where he would say that a man that lives in the woods comes to my window at night and watches me while i sleep and uh before he had actually come out and talked about that and said that the day he was riding the go-kart we i, I it made me remember that he uh all of a sudden had to make sure that window was completely covered that there wasn't any part of the window that was left exposed curtains and stuff like that matter of fact you see right now there's a blanket over the window because a curtain wasn't enough he wanted to be able to make sure there was no sunlight that could come through like maybe you know or a thin curtain and uh that, that, that was their bedroom whenever all that stuff was taking place and i never i never followed sasquatch or bigfoot or any of that stuff i've never listened Harry and Henderson was the last thing I seen about Bigfoot back in the 90s. Never watched Finding Bigfoot or any of that stuff. It wasn't an interest to me. This is not my hobby. And uh, this is not a, a passion or a, a, an interest of mine. This was something that I was forced into, the way I look at it as a drafted researcher, that I was forced to educate myself on this, this subject because of uh, my son's encounter on November the 10th. But anyway, uh, but... To listen to him the way he describes it, a man that lives so lives in the wood and looks at me, you know, comes to my window at night and watches me while I sleep. Well, I remember after that, and then it started to make sense to me because I remember when it changed for him, my son Trevor, nine years old, to where he wanted to make sure the windows were completely covered up at night. You had to make sure and pull them to the edge. There could be no visible part of that window left open everything had to be completely covered before he would go to bed at night and I, I thought back and i remembered when that started it wasn't till later that he told us about the man that lives in the woods quoting him and uh you know there were some other things that had happened i thought back to about uh three or four months prior to my son's experience i heard his melodic whistle uh about 2 a.m we have my wife and i had two boys from a previous marriage uh, her and I both, and uh, we had all of our kids up here. They were playing PlayStation one night. We were in the bed. I heard this melodic whistle chatter, and the, the whistle was so complex. I've never heard anybody be able to whistle like that. And I immediately sit up in the bed, caught my attention. And my dogs, my parents' dogs that were on the front porch next door, and they immediately started howling. And I thought that was strange that they didn't bark because I've got a one dog in particular is very protective and has, you know, bitten more than one or two or three people. It's the whole reason why we got the chain link fence fence in the backyard because of her. And she never left the front porch. They stayed on the porch and howled. And I thought that was strange. And then I heard the whistle chatter again while I was sitting up in alert. I could blame the first off as in, in a slumber kind of sleep, but the second time after the dogs were howling, I heard it a second time, unmistakable. Now, this is a clip of the strange whistle, and you're gonna hear some dogs howling and cutting up, uh, probably at the whistle. Uh, I don't know what to make of it. 
Uh, maybe you have heard this before, but it's definitely very strange, and I can see what he means by melodic. said no idea what that is i don't believe i've ever heard that before it is very strange and i remember googling the best way i could describe what i heard and it kept coming back as bigfoot vocalizations but i still didn't give it any real consideration it might must have been something else and just you just don't it's like you you don't want to think about it because you don't want to to uh to own up or face the fact that there might be something out there that people say doesn't exist you know, I had an old Arlo uh, security camera system that we used inside the house. We never put cameras outside our house. We put them on the inside of the house. We want to see what kid was choking out which kid and all that stuff and beating each other up. We was worried about the stuff going on inside the house, not the stuff going on outside. And my, we had a tanning bed inside the house, and my wife would always take the cameras down when she got inside the tanning bed. So I, I, and she would disconnect it every time she got a chance, just make sure pulled it out of the wall and so finally we just stuck it on top of the refrigerator wasn't even using it anymore i got that old arlo system down uh and uh two of the four cameras still would hold battery charge so we charged up two of the cameras i put the hub back in i put one camera on each side of the house and that was my first you know trying to set out to validate my son's experience and uh i had reached out on one of the most ridiculous places for uh, for help, Reddit. I didn't know any better. Let me go over there and ask some of these guys for advice. <laughs> and man, looking back, it seems so ignorant, man. I'm like, God, I went to Reddit for help. I'm like, hey, I think I got Bigfoot watching my kids. I'm like, anybody got any tips or something I could look for, or some stuff I could try? And man, it blew up. I mean, it, the thread just went crazy. And uh, it was such a waste of time because instead of getting advice, I was spent more time answering all these other questions of people just being curious or trying to, you know, debunk whatever I was talking about than actually getting any usable advice. But during that time, December the third, um, the dog, the dogs were going crazy one night, and the most aggressive protective dog, depending on how you want to word it, uh, Bailey. He's a pretty good-sized dog. Uh, she's bitten UPS man to FedEx man, two male ladies, the next-door neighbor down here, and my wife. <laughs> she's, been, she's been through a list, and uh, this dog was making almost a distress sound. I had a, a guy that I know had a professional animal person look at that video and analyze the dog's behavior and it was you know she said the dog sounded like it was in distress and matter of fact it was so out of character for her that when i showed my mother the video my mother didn't even believe that it was actually her dog and it was just and it was looking towards the woods and there was two previous videos that were recorded by the camera to where she's just sitting there locked in on something stiff as a statue for two short videos and never moved then she started making those sounds really caught my attention and I was watching the live feed and I she turns and leaves and goes back inside my parents house shortly after that you see a shadow of a bipedal figure approaching the rear of my home and there was a security light on this side of my house and it was casting this bipedal creature's shadow out to the side of my house and that's what my camera caught did do some cuts on this uh, just about the time you see the dog leave to the left it takes about another minute or so before you see the shadow so I cut out that space in between but as soon as you see the dog leave to the left keep your eyes trained on the bottom right corner of your screen
Now you can say whatever you want about this shadow, but what is interesting is that there doesn't appear to be a neck and it's not bobbing up and down like it's vaulting over its legs. And we've heard so many times that these creatures just move smoothly. Uh, you be the judge. We'll see it a few more times and then we'll see it in slow motion. Now this is another couple of images that Mark captured on one of his cameras. You can see this thing standing on the left side of the screen. And in this other shot, you'll see it standing a little bit further back, walking away. Incredible. And I saw this live and I freaked out. And in the original video that I have of that, you can hear me. Because the camera's sitting right outside my bedroom window on top of it. It's just sitting on top of a window unit air conditioner in our bedroom just sitting on there and uh you can hear me kind of freak out a little bit and you hear me going through the bathroom because the bathroom links to our kids bedrooms where my wife was and i'm like i just saw it on camera it's outside get ready keep the kids inside the bedroom i grabbed my ar-15 and i said call 911 and uh I, I i was fixing to go outside and i just for some reason, I had a flash in my mind of Jurassic Park. I can't tell you why, but if there's this part of Jurassic Park with this professional hunter, is hunting the uh, Velociraptor, and the one's distracting him, getting his attention, and that one pops out the bushes to the side, and he's like, oh, clever girl, boom, gets him. I had that flash for a minute, and I had I reconsidered going outside, opened up the front door, shot off four warning shots, called 911. Uh, the uh, deputy showed up. This is a still from when the sheriff came out. He managed to capture on one of the many cameras he had set out. He's like, well, you ever had any trespassers before? Do you think you might know who it is? Now, I'm not from here. I'm up here because my father had a stroke. I know people at the VFW and the volunteer fire department through my father. That's it. We never had anything come up stolen out here except for dog food. And, uh... You know, I'm like, oh, no, I don't know anybody. I've never had that before. And I was honest with the deputy. I said, to be honest with you, I said, I'm not sure it was a person. He said, what do you mean? He said, uh, I told him, I said, well, my son had an, something happened to him less than a month ago inside the yard. I said, I'm, I, I seriously, just the reason why I put the cameras up, I'm seriously considering it might be a Bigfoot. He's like, oh, you know, he's like, uh, well, I'll tell you what, he said, here's the police report. If you'll just fill out the top of it, I'll fill the rest of it in for you, and I'll turn it in. And uh, I knew that he didn't, he did not, he didn't believe me. He didn't take it serious. I don't blame him. I wouldn't either. And it was just, I can't believe that I even just opened up and just bl and told him about that. And uh, anyway, uh, he left. I had pulled that video footage off of my security camera cloud and put it onto a USB drive. I went ahead and I, I had a company YouTube page for my company Livewire, where I did low voltage wiring and stuff, you know, control panels and things of that nature. I actually wired, you know, security cameras set up doing Cat5, you know, uh, wiring and things like that for businesses and stuff. And that was the reason why I named my company Livewire. That'd be a big Motley Crue fan from the 80s. And so I put, um, the, the that was the first video I loaded up to my YouTube page. It wasn't to, get followers it wasn't to get views it was to share that footage where the sheriff could go to my youtube page and view the footage from that security thing because i wanted i wanted a, a paper trail i wanted police reports because if i had to take action against a person or anything and had to kill it i wanted a paper trail of repeated trespassers on my property and me making complaints. That's why it was important for me to make a police report. So I went down to the sheriff's office the very next morning 
and I sat down in there and they said, well, what can we help you with? I said, look, I want to file a police report. I said, I had a deputy out to my house last night. And I said, to be honest with you, I don't think he turned my police report in. He said, what was it regarding? I said, I had a trespasser on my property and I called 911. He said, well, I don't know why he wouldn't have turned in the police report. And I said, well, there might be a little bit more to it. Maybe it's something that I said to him that maybe may not take what I was talking about so serious. And there was a man and a woman in there. And the guy said, uh, he said, well, sit down and talk to me about it. And they got a couple chairs there inside the, sh the sheriff's office. And uh, I sit down and started talking to him. He said, uh, I said, well, I got the footage right here. Let me show it to you. He looked at it. He didn't say anything. He said, uh, well, who, who, who do you think it was? I said, well, I'm not sure if it's a who. He said, what do you mean? I said, I think it might have been something else. And I didn't realize that this deputy, you know, had been on expeditions before and was part of a, uh, a local, that had been participating in some of the stuff here uh, with a group of uh, Native Oklahoma Bigfoot Research Organization. And he knew the person who founded that group, uh, Troy Hudson. But at the time, he's like, well, let's just go outside. Let's talk. He goes, I need to smoke a cigarette. Let's go outside. Let's talk outside. So I went outside. He said, uh, he said, what do you think that was? I said, to be honest with you, I said, my son had an experience. I said, if something happened to him in the yard. He saw the scene. I said, it seems to be a Bigfoot. I said, to be honest with you, I said, I know that sounds crazy, but between what my son saw and what you see in this video and my dog's behavior, I said, I got to give it serious consideration. He goes, and this, what he opened up is what he told me. He said, look, he said, this time of the year, hunters are entering the woods. He said, they're moving around. He said, because they're, the, the, their food source, some of the stuff they're eating off the vines and all, you know, berries and things like that, it, you know, are dying off. He said, uh, their food source is changing. He said, we get a lot of reports around this time of uh, things that some people say could be a Bigfoot. He said, a lot of times people contact me directly. He said, uh, he said, look, I'm gonna give you my personal cell phone number. He says, uh, usually when you shoot like I did, he said, when they become aware that you're aware of them, a lot of times they move on. And he told me a story about something recent where um, a guy shot at one and he said the activity quit. And he gave me his personal cell phone number he's very helpful and um, the next morning he actually called my cell phone and wanted to know if there was any activity that night if, if anything happened I'm like no nothing had happened uh, and uh, he said well I told you like I said a lot of times they move on but that's not where it ended but that was the uh, the uh, how everything started I went back to reddit and I posted the video of the shadow moving and people got still frames of it you see the uh, it was a, a it, it was a rounded top head seemed to be maybe a juvenile they had steel frames from the shadow and all this other stuff and it blew up but I wasn't getting any serious help or, or answers that I was seeking because I wasn't looking to have to get karma points on uh, on reddit I was looking for advice on what I should do should I be concerned I have no knowledge of this subject luckily there was a guy from another group another website called bigfootforums.com that was reading that thread he took my thread and posted it over on bigfoot forums and they were talking about it over here on this website that i didn't even know about and they sent me an invite and they said look if you want more serious discussion and look for some help he said why don't you uh come over here and they invited me over there there was still a lot of the same stuff that was going on with reddit where people was talking and trying to just over analyze some, you know too many things and but through that website, I met a guy named Joe, and uh, Joe is somebody that I very rarely talked about, but is so instrumental uh, to me uh, having the knowledge and the, uh, the evidence that I have today. He reached out to me early on right after that, and he said, look, I'm in Tulsa. I'm not affiliated with any kind of group. I have some knowledge about this. I would like to help if you would allow me. And Joe drove down from Tulsa on December the 6th. He brought six game cameras, an ice chest with some apples and some bird seed and stuff. He said, look, we're going to set up a camera watching each camera kind of grid back here. We're going to see, you know, just if we capture anything. He said, one thing I've learned from doing this right here, once they see that you are setting up a trap, a bait type station, he said, either they move on or it gets worse. He said, most of the time, from my experience, they move on. And we set that up, and that was on December 6th, and uh, that was the beginning of starting to...
to try to get answers. And Joe was very instrumental to that. And uh, he was, uh, and I still, Think about Joe a lot. How do you help? What do you, what do, you do specifically? He showed up. He never questioned. He never doubted me. He was... I heard him have a conversation with some other people that he was affiliated with. And he said, yeah, there's definitely activity. There's something going on. I think we should do this. And, uh, man, for somebody to reach out to a total stranger, they don't have, they don't even know. And to go through the expense that he did and refuse any kind of compensation, even gas money, whatever, to, to put himself out like that to help me and my family with complete strangers, it really affected me. And, uh, and I, I, since then, I've helped other people that I found in my similar situation, but I've only done what Joe did for me, a portion of what Joe did for me and my family. Once he did what he comes set to do, I mean, I still got his number, but he's just like, I call him, I call him the Bigfoot Equalizer. Remember that 80s TV show? Guy shows up in the Jaguar, kind of, you know, the underdog helps the underdog out. Then once he's like, he was the playing field, he takes off. That's why I call him the Bigfoot Equalizer, but, he, he's got a couple other people he's affiliated with, and I call him the B-team, you know, instead of the A-team, he's part of the B-team. You know, if you can find him, and you find yourself in need, maybe you can hire the B-team, that's him. So, that's what I tease him about, but uh, I feel like he's just one of those behind-the-scenes guys that, you know, the people don't know about, but it really did change everything for me because he was the one that supplied the game cameras. He was... Uh, as things got progressively worse, he was the guy that I was sending everything that I was capturing. Everything went through him. I sent it to his email, and he would decide whether or not he wanted to put it on, you know, the form where we were talking about that stuff. I'm real adamant about not asking anybody for any kind of donations. I've never accepted donations, no fundraisers, none of that stuff. He knew I was very sensitive about that, so Joe would just come flat out lie to me. He's like, man, I got this stuff laying around I already had. I thought I was going to use it for something and never did. Then he'd leave, and I'm looking at him like, man, that stuff ain't never been opened up out of the package before. <laughs> but he knew that, that I had a problem with that, that I, I, didn't, I didn't want people to be out, you know, him to be out of expense on that. He's like... He said, I brought some game cameras for some friends of mine, but they're all brand new, and, you know, and, uh, he brought, he, man, he ended up bringing 19 game cameras, another Arlo system to go in conjunction with my other Arlo system, there's infrared perimeter devices and things that he brought, infrared perimeter alarms, and just all kinds of things, I don't know where I would be at today with, uh, capturing evidence with what I just had myself because I'm like I ordered two game cameras today off Amazon I'll see if I can get something on camera <laughs> you know not realizing that two game cameras is a complete joke I mean there's you put them one right at the other that's it <laughs> what about the rest of the yard you know <laughs> like I said we put the game cameras on de uh, December 6th uh, we were checking those periodically um, I, the game I started like I said with the Arlo system being wireless uh, cameras that have microphones and speakers on them they were really I don't think I would have captured anything if I had a different type of system like a regular conventional wired security camera system where you can't turn the infrared lights off at night uh, I think being able to control the infrared lights the LEDs on the front of the cameras them having microphones good microphones actually I can hear stuff on the camera that I can't hear standing there next to it. So I have the additional cameras out there. We have a storm shelter that's real close, I mean within feet of the edge of the woods where a lot of this activity was happening, where my son had his sighting, where he saw the two at, one with the white face. The uh, the melodic whistle that I heard was coming from this general area. This, this stretch of woods comes up between my house and my parents house with the storm shelter in the middle. And so I hit a camera inside the whirly bird from inside that way they wouldn't see me installing it because i go down inside the storm shelter and i hit a, a camera inside the whirly bird from inside the storm shelter facing these woods you hear a lot of stories people say that uh indians say that they're the watchers that 
a lot of times if you put something out, they're watching you put a camera out and that's how they know where it's at. It's one theory. So I came up with the idea that I was gonna go down into the storm shelter, insert a camera into that whirly bird from inside. And that's what I did. And that camera, I caught a lot of uh, limb breaks, uh, different kind of sounds and uh, bipedal footsteps, just all kinds of different things uh, on that camera. And uh, it's hidden inside the water bird. It's not in there now. Um, I finally took it out. But um, this area of the woods is the stretch of woods that's narrow that comes up between my home and my parents' home and is the where the most activity has happened. Um, and usually when they're approaching the home, this is where they usually come up through. This is where I've cast footprints. This is where the limb breaks, the, uh, where the lean tree is located right back here also. Um, this is where my son had his siding is all in this stretch of woods right through here that's close to both homes. Now what you're about to see here is just some of what Mark captured on his property. Uh, keep your eyes trained right here. We'll take another look at that, a little more zoomed in. And this is two hours later and you're gonna see what appears to be the whole family. I count four figures in this one. Now, it is a long shot and mildly ambiguous, but I think the striking thing to me is the behavior. They seem very apprehensive, like they're coming up closer and closer, and then that's as close as they get, and then go back into the woods. Now, I don't think anyone can question that those are upright walking figures. Uh, even though it is at a distance, um, it, it just looks like whatever that is is on two legs. Now, is it Sasquatch? I don't know. But we are looking at the evidence here. You decide for yourself. And I started picking up, uh, you know, footsteps. Um, I started catching limb breaks, loud limb breaks, almost like gunshots going off. Pow! Very deliberate. And there wouldn't be any wind blowing, there wouldn't be any other sounds, and all of a sudden you just hear this limb just snap. And I've got so many of those that I've captured. There's three or four of them that I put up on my YouTube, but I have way more than that. And it was very deliberate. And at the time I was so new in this subject, and I was like what I call taking night classes, uh, going to night school for Bigfoot researcher stuff and I didn't really associate the limb breaks. I knew it was unusual but I didn't know that that was a uh, you know typical Bigfoot you know behavior that people have talked about but I started hearing recording that uh, the, the strange dog behavior I noticed that all the dogs would urinate at that same spot close to uh, in that same area every day they come outside the back door and they would urinate just like line up to take it right there in that same spot and I thought that was unusual. Well, when I started putting the cameras up, I noticed that the dogs quit urinating there and they started urinating on the other side of the yard at the next woods that's across from my home. And so I'm like, oh, and it just dawned on me. I said, I wonder if they're, if they switched up and started coming around over here. 
So I put cameras up over there and I was recording activity over there, the limb breaks and the, you hear something heavy moving through the woods on camera and stuff like that. And uh, it was a lot of small things like that, nothing definitive, nothing that was 100% uh, proof for me. Um, that all, then the activity started to get a lot more frequent and it, um, I remember um, th I was catching all this stuff and I was running it through Joe and Joe says I think we need to step up the cameras and then it was around December the 20th he come down with 19 additional game cameras four of them being cellular game cameras and a host of other stuff a perimeter uh, infrared perimeter alarm system that sits off inside the house it's got a 300 foot range between two sensors and all kinds of different things and Man, we set up a buku of stuff around here. Little trigger alarms that with like, you know, fishing line between the trees and stuff, just all kinds of stuff. And uh, you would think that with all the additional 19 cameras surrounding the perimeter of our property where the woods are, that that would uh, deter them from coming around. Actually, that was the beginning of the peak activity for us was around December the 21st and there was things that I was recording and capturing that I didn't even realize that I was recording and capturing until later when I was reviewing through footage and stuff and there's been so many significant things that I found in old footage that I didn't you got you got to learn how to look for them once you become better and, and learn more about how they how they act and how they you can go back through that old footage and you'll see stuff that you missed and blew over before and um, but the most significant thing that happened right as it was happening, I knew they were coming around. It was coming. It was Christmas Eve. Uh, I heard stuff on camera. I'll go outside with the flashlight recording, and I didn't realize that I recorded that night until almost three months later. But there's a fence directly behind the playhouse area where a lot of this activity is taking place. And at this corner post, you see me come out with a flashlight. There's nothing there. When I come back, you see a small black figure that appears to be crouched down with his back to me. December 26th, that's, that was, I was, I changed the camera position. That's a good thing about the RL cameras being wireless and battery operated. You can move them around. I always relocated them. Even if it was just 10 foot, I'd move them around. So December 26th came. That was the earliest that they had came at the time. The previous night they had come at 9 o'clock. This time they was there by 7. And uh, I, for some reason, again, I can't tell you why, just the intuition. I kicked on the camera in the new location on the playhouse pointing towards those pine trees, and I saw the juvenile standing beside the pine tree looking at the camera. I didn't hit record. It's just one of those things. It's where I just dropped the phone, grabbed the gun, grabbed the flashlight, and went outside. And when I went outside, uh, no, I, I did have the camera recording shortly after that. I, I recorded, I turned both cameras on recording. I grabbed my gun, grabbed my flashlight, and I went outside. And I didn't see anything. I was panning with the flashlight the first time I went out. I didn't see anything. I came back inside, uh, waited a little while. I turned the same camera back on, and now there was something sitting in front of the camera where there wasn't before. The camera... The, the, the two rear jungle jar, uh, jungle gym beams that come off the back of the playhouse, the camera was sitting on top of one of those two by sixes pointing towards the pine trees. When I, 20 minutes later after coming back inside, I turned that same camera back on, something was sitting in front of the lens. And you could see a little something out the side, but it was the, uh, it was reflecting back into the lens. You couldn't see anything, but I could still hear. And I could hear something moving around. So I went back outside with the flashlight again, shine the light, uh, had a uh, with me and uh, my flashlight and I, rem I, I wouldn't go near the playhouse because I, I assumed that's where it was. I come out here with a flashlight. I was standing right over here in the driveway with the flashlight pointed towards the playhouse. I reached down to unholster my pistol. Flashlight still pointing ahead. When I reached down to get my gun, there was a juvenile crouched over here at the, on the other side of the playhouse. It stood up, walked in front of my flashlight beam, and crouched down right there where that ladder is. 
and when it walked in front of my flashlight beam, its shadow was cast on that shed, and the camera that was up here hidden on the back of the playhouse caught the uh, shadow being cast on the shed. Now this is the footage that camera captured that night of the shadow. Now you'll see Mark shining his light around there, and when he shines it on the jungle gym, you'll see this thing walk in front of it. Right there. And we'll take another look at that. Now I zoomed this in and slowed it down so you can get a good look at this. Mark is standing still. This is not parallax. We'll take another look. I slowed it down to 50%. Look right here. Look at that arm. That just looks like a hairy arm to me. That was the first time that I seen something. The way it moved. The way it was within 20 foot of me and I, I never heard it. It never made a sound. Uh, I knew that there was something out there that people didn't, that people said didn't exist. And that, I knew right then that it was out in my front yard. No hesitation, instantaneous reaction. Stood up and relocated and took a place where it had more cover. And uh, I saw that and I was on the phone with Joe and I said, Joe, I think I just saw something. I said, let me, let me, let me just make sure that I saw what I thought I saw and I'll call you right back. And I pulled up the footage, downloaded it, sent a copy to him and he's like oh my god i said i know and that was when i knew with that a hundred with a hundred percent of a doubt no doubt left that there was something that was not human that people say doesn't exist and it was in my front yard on my kids around my kids playground equipment that's when i it took a different turn I debate, I was in it. I remember being in the bathroom, I was talking to Joe, I said, Joe, I don't know if I can show my wife this. I don't know if I can show my wife this. I don't know what she's gonna do. I don't know how she's gonna react. I was freaking out myself. This thing moved and it was not it was moving it was moving almost like something you saw in a movie. I'm twenty foot away and I never heard it move. Uh it can be co completely quiet when it wants to be. And uh I was freaking out and uh I said, I don't know if I can show this. I said, I got to. I need her help. I need her help. I said, I got to go show this to my wife. And I show it to my wife. She's freaking out. We're getting the hell out of here. And I said, no. No, we're putting a stop to this right now. I said, I'm fixing to kill this. I got my AR-15. Uh, full metal jacket, 5.56 five, rounds. And uh, I got a night vision scope on it. And I said, we know what's behind the playhouse. I said, on the count of three, I want you to throw open the front door, because my front door, you open up the front door of my home, you're looking directly at that playhouse. I said, on the count of three, I want you to throw the front door open and I'm gonna shoot this. <laughs> and I didn't really understand what I was fixing to try to attend. And uh, count of three, my wife threw open the front door. I already had my AR-15 set up, night vision scope. I saw it standing behind the playhouse. It has a railing around the side of the playhouse. And I seen it looking between the slats of the railing like this. It was going back and forth looking at me. And I, I looked, it seemed like it seemed like longer, but it probably was only just a few seconds. And I, I looked at it, and my wife's like, did you see it, did you see it? I'm like, yeah, it's quite quiet. I sit there and looked at it for a second, and I swear it was looking back and forth. It was almost like it was watching my trigger finger. Because as soon as I went to squeeze that trigger, boom, that jungle was gone. And my wife set up this damn outside tent thing that we had got in this camper we bought and it was in the damn way and I'm like, oh my god, I couldn't get another shot off. I was pissed. I tore that <laughs> down. This stuff. <dumb. laughs> I'm throwing it. Tear that damn tent thing down. Boy, that joke was but I, I didn't realize, man, that that was a blessing. It's a blessing I'm such a piss poor shot and I got piss poor eyesight. It's a blessing that thing so fast and that that tent thing was in the way because I probably would have took another shot at it. And uh, I'm so glad I missed. Without a doubt, man, I, that I was 100% convinced that these creatures were real. They were freaking in my property. They've been coming to my property. What is their intention? What is their intention? I had people that were wanting to come out and hunt and do all this stuff. I wouldn't allow that to happen because I, the last thing I need them to do would be like, well, let's go out here and get them, boys, and just light the damn woods up. Like Tropic Thunder. <laughs> There, right? And then like, well, we, I got, we might have got them, I don't know, we'll come back tomorrow and see, and then leave me with the repercussions of stirring up a damn, uh, you know, a clan of Sasquatch. So that was the reason why I wouldn't allow anybody to come out and to hunt them, because I don't need them to, well, 
my wife called supper's ready we gotta go and leave me with the repercussions of stirring up and getting them all off so i was doing that on my own so um you know uh and uh Everything that people said to try wasn't working. People was like, have you tried talking to them? Yeah, I got the suggestion. Go talk to them. I'm, either they weren't listening that day or, or they weren't around, but they weren't listening to me when I told them that they were scaring my family and they needed to go on and they were not welcome here and that I would stay inside my yard. I would stay out of their woods. They were welcome to stay inside the woods. Just don't come around my home and all this stuff. I tried it through the microphones on the cameras when I heard activity. I tried going out there doing it vocally straight to the woods. It didn't work. Of course, I've recorded a lot more stuff since then, a lot more activity. Uh, more things have happened with my daughter, uh, specifically having, an episode, having a, a, a freak out one day when she saw one step out of the woods. My daughter and I, we come back here to check the garden and uh, she was with me that day. Uh, we, we have a chain link fence that we put up around the perimeter back here in my parents' backyard. But we also, you see part where the, another fence used to be around the garden, that was to keep my daughter out. Cause she'll come in here, pick everything off the, whether it's ready to be picked or not. So we were back here. She was over here fiddling with the gate, trying to get inside the garden. I stepped off over here where my mother had heard the whistling chatter like uh like i had in this thick uh a foliage over here that's close to her bedroom so i was over here standing in part of the yard madonna was right here i felt a little bit more comfortable at ease by stepping 20 foot away from her because we were inside this chain link fence area fence i had my back to her this is where i heard her start screaming she turned she fell down stood back up and ran to me and put her arm around my leg and she was standing right over here and she was pointing back in this area right here trying to show me something but i noticed immediately that she didn't see what she originally saw because even though she was pointing right here she started doing this moving her head down through these trees trying to find what she saw i knew that there was one that had to step out and see her uh, show itself to her what happened next after that was Shortly after that happened, my mother pulled up. She had been uptown. I went out there and talked to my mom. I was telling her what happened. I told her, I said, watch, watch Caitlin. I fixed it to get my camera and my gun. I'm gonna go out here and see what's going on because I firmly believe there was one right here in that, in this immediate area right then. While I was telling that to my mother, there was no wind like there is today. I heard a loud limb break while I was talking to my mom. And I said, they're there. It's almost like they were telling me, come on, man, wrap it up with your mom and let's get this thing started. I grabbed my gun, I grabbed my camera. I walked right out through here. I was recording. Somebody said that they see something brown move and crouch down in my video right when I'm entering these woods. I can't see it myself, I, uh, but could be in there, could not. But I walked out here, I walked around, and that's one of the only times that I found a footprint myself. Uh, very defined footprint. It had rained off and on for five days. Very clear footprint. Had toe definition. You can see where the mud come up between its toes. Uh, the one and only time that I've actually took the time to cast a footprint. One and only track I ever made I found was, uh, it was right here. Matter of fact, we just walked out here where it was. There's the bowl where I mixed up the, the, the plaster that day. Uh, it was right here, the leaning tree is right here you can see my parents home and my home from right here uh this is, i found this today that my daughter uh was in the garden with me and had her little freak out session i come out here found a fresh track it'd been raining off and on that five days the track was fresh see toe definition and everything it's the first time attempting the only time i've ever cast a track so it didn't, the the actual video of the footprint actually turned out better than the cast did but uh, close proximity to the leaning tree, my home, you see both houses and it was right here. Was there, did, did you see any remnants of possible any other tracks? Was that the only one visible? I am, it's the only one I found and I am horrible at finding those things. Usually tracks and stuff are usually what David finds. It has to be something like a Hollywood Walk of Fame where they put their handprints down for me to see it. You know, it's got to be something just clear as day. Like, oh, look at that. But, so and for I, you to find it, it was pretty significant. Yeah, it was It was, It was. was very clear, definite track, or I never would have saw it, I promise you. You heard Mark mention David. 
he contacted independent Bigfoot researcher David Wilbanks, over 25 years of experience, to come and try to assist him with his Bigfoot issue. Actually, David was one of the first people that I sent an email out to before I was even certain that I was going to come forward and share my story with my name attached to it. Uh, David had been collecting reportings and sightings in this area that I live in, in southeast Oklahoma, for a long time. And I just, it, it, at first I just wanted to share with him what had been happening around my property, for it to go into his database and the location and things like that. And at the time when I sent him a detailed email about activity around my property, I had asked him not to share it or read it on his channel at the time. And, uh, and him and I started to correspond back and forth. And uh, David was actually the first one that uh, read an email about the activity on my property online. It was before Dixie Cryptid and all that. David was actually the first. And the reason why I reached out to David was because the people that I wanted to reach I wanted to hear what I had been experiencing was the people that lived in my area the most. And he was a researcher, uh, well-known. <clears throat> I didn't really know just how, how well-known he was at the time, but, uh, you know, but he has done a lot of, uh, collected a lot of reports in this area. So, you know, he was the reason why I reached out to him first, uh, very early on when I first started, you know, talking about things that have been happening over the last few months here. David, what do you remember of that initial contact? Well, at first I got an email. <clears throat> it was actually a series of emails. I don't know how many of them. It's quite a few, but talking about, um, well, at first, like you said earlier, I didn't realize he was sending me pictures, too, on there. I was just reading the account. But it, it got my attention because it seemed like there was quite a bit going around, or a lot, excuse me, a lot happening just close to his house with his uh, uh, son making the comment one that really stood out was about the little toy car you'd got him the electric car he could drive and made the comment he couldn't he can't catch me now and of course mark said well who are you talking about uh one of the more memorable events that i kind of blew over back in the day was um he used to be so scared to get off the school bus the school bus would drop him off right there where the where the blacktop road is and he would um be scared to walk from up, from there to up here where our house is and he would insist that I be down there or his mother to either walk him up home or to give him a ride in the car up here and I thought it was kind of ridiculous at the time but he, he was one he did not ever talk about why he was scared he just thought it was maybe a young kid just scared uh, for whatever reason and uh, we purchased him a, a go-kart he was so want a go-kart for some reason well, I just figured well, because a kid wants a go-kart. I know I did when I was young. So we bought him a go-kart, and he was so excited to have this go-kart. And he was outside riding around these pine trees one day. And he said, uh, my wife heard him say, well, they can't catch me now. And she said, what do you mean by they can't catch you now? And his exact words was, there's a man that lives in the woods. He comes to my window at night and watches me while I sleep. And it wasn't till as that conversation progressed between him and his mother that he talked about a man that would be down here in the woods when he got off the bus that would be waiting on him and would start moving through the woods as he was coming up the driveway and um, he never mentioned this i guess he was scared to tell us so that we wouldn't believe him but it, it wasn't until we bought that go-kart that this even come out and uh, the reason for the go-kart was apparently he thought that this thing was after him and that with the go-kart he could outrun it that it couldn't catch him now and of course i blew it off a kid with overactive imagination i didn't take it into much consideration it wasn't until later when other events happened that i reflected back to uh that you know uh, occurrence and um you know i was sending david a lot of uh evidence and things that I had captured in video and pictures and things like that. He didn't realize it at first. And finally one day I guess it hit him that there was a bunch <coughs> of stuff attached to the emails that I received. And he's like, oh my God, I'm looking through this stuff that you're sending me. And he's like, it's kind of overwhelming. And uh, we started uh, talking on the telephone. And uh, he I invite, he asked if he could come out sometime. I said, well, sure, of course. And uh, 
that's when I actually met David and he come out to the property and uh, that first time you come out was pretty interesting. Uh, we went into mm -hmm. the woods that day and I really hadn't been out there looking uh, before that before that time. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd got here and uh, Mark come out. We talked a little bit and then we went back into the woods here and he showed me some uh, things he knew. I wanted a, a branch that was twisted and broke the way it was, like it was a oh, good seven foot off the ground, I guess, something, a oh, branch about that big around, something grabbed it and twisted it and bent it down. So we found footprints, uh, three different sized individuals uh, out in the woods and back over here, uh, they're better to find in this uh, power line cut because there was some mud back there where, where uh, one with a smaller foot had, had stepped in and made a pretty good impression. And then, uh, of course, in the in the trees, it's a lot of leaf litter, but you can still, you know, make out some pretty good footprints through there. Mark had told me his folks were hearing noises out here, and we're just probably 30 feet from the house, so me and Mark come down here and followed here, and right here we found a, an impression in the leaves, where it's all covered up in the leaves, and um, after fishing the leaves out of it carefully, like so, um, there was a print distinguishable enough that I felt was good enough to cast, and we made a made a cast of it. it turned out pretty good. Well, along the uh, area where you know I'm, I'm calling it a game trail, where these things were obviously walking and leaving the tracks, we did find uh, what well, the remains of a fawn out there that something had killed and left the remains of there. Of course, two that front, two front legs were still attached, but it was ripped off the. They were they were twisted up pretty good. I mean, that mm -hmm. could have been another predator, yeah. but it it was uh, the bedding area. interesting right there where it was. Found a possible bedding area down there under some cedars. You know, uh, it's a possibility. Now, the most interesting things that I've found have been the the tree twist, uh, the limb twist down there, and the and the footprints. I tell you. <clears throat> You know, after you and I developed a friendship and stuff, and I remember when things were happening, and uh, I felt like I could call you and talk to you and confide in you with things, because there was stuff that I would call and tell David that I never would talk openly with anybody, not even my wife. And uh, one of the things I remember talking to you about was the electrical interference that the cameras were picking up. And on the security cameras, I'd have electrical interference that would... Uh, correspond on days of activity and the game cameras would also have audio interference electrical interference on those also even though they're out there inside the woods and uh, I started talking to David about that and he has something very interesting to share me share with me back from his uh, past you know the electrical interference I don't know what that has to do with Bigfoot or whatever but I've actually received a couple of reports of um, you know when the Bigfoot sighting happened to, well, there's a young man over here in LaFleur County talking about it affecting the lights on his pickup. And he was hesitant to tell me about it. But um, I said, no, no, if it's what happened, I said, share it, you know, because we'll, it may not, you know, be directly, you know, related, but it's something you experience. So I think to truly investigate something, you got to listen to the whole story, not prejudge it to what it is. And, but yeah, Mark's had several uh, instances out here with, uh, electrical interference with stuff and I, I I don't know what to make of that I'd actually referred you to a, a fellow that researches stuff in that area named Stan Gordon up north it's put a lot of time you've if you've heard that name yeah uh, done a lot of research in it they actually call it the Pennsylvania effect when you've got uh, Bigfoot reports corresponding with things like that or even UFOs or stuff but that's uh well let's let's go from the from the premise that this is some kind of electromagnetic interference. How significant do you think those high power lines are being that close? If that is the case. I've, had, I've heard a lot of people talk about the power lines and the theories behind that, that they're travel ways or whatever, they're over the recharging their batteries. You know, everybody's heard that stuff that follows the subject. But what I found particular about what I was observing was there was not always audio or electrical interference on the cameras. And, uh, it was on days of obvious activity, like December 24th. You have on my security cameras the audio interference, the electrical interference that builds up. And what even got me started looking at it was somebody commented on one of my YouTube videos where you hear a loud limb break. You hear this audio 
electrical interference is coming in through the microphone, it stops, the limb breaks, and then the audio electrical interference resumes after the, the limb breaks, but it stops for a split second while the limb breaks and then resumes. And somebody pointed that out to me and I never noticed that before. And I actually contributed to having like a metal roof and siding on my house, the reason why I was having those uh, uh, audio interference problems. But when he pointed out that it stopped while the limb broke and then resumed, I started, uh, you know, thinking about it, you know, in a different kind of light. Well, then I, <clears throat> uh, some of my game cameras have audio on them, and I was noticing on days that I had recordings of obvious activity and had audio interference on the security cameras for my house, the game cameras located out in the woods that are away from stuff that would have uh, electrical interference would have interference on the game camera videos around the same time that I was getting interference on the security cameras. And then some days when there wasn't activity, there was no interference on any of the cameras, game cameras or the security cameras. And it just seemed kind of, you know, awful, uh, you know, peculiar that uh, the days of uh, activity, there'd be audio interference on the game cameras that are not Wi-Fi, they're not cellular network they don't transmit or receive any kind of signal you got to go pull the sd card out but the same days corresponding with the activity and the security cameras at the house all had the same uh, type of audio interference on both and i uh, started having to give you know more consideration to the uh stuff that i've heard about them being able to you know cause some type of interference with electrical devices I never give it much thought before that, but it all started with that one comment from a subscriber pointing out the uh, interference stopping whenever they heard the limb break and then resume. We went to film some of the anomalous structures found close to the house, and I know how a lot of people feel about structures, but I want to read something written by my good friend Christopher Noel. It's a view that deserves sharing. Structure skeptics like to ask, how can we claim to know that Sasquatch build stick and tree structures until we catch them in the act? It all comes down to what standards one applies to potential evidence, but it's possible to have standards that are too high, empirically high. For me, finding potential Sasquatch structures is not reason enough to conclude that Sasquatch made them. Finding structures is just step one. Step two is indispensable. To record and listen to audio in the same forest for many nights, hundreds of hours, and if wood knocks or obvious vocalizations are captured here at, say, 2.45 a.m., then I'm comfortable connecting the two phenomena. It's not 100% proof, I agree, but it is a preponderance of evidence. That is, I accept that it's much more likely that the structures in this particular forest were made by Sasquatch rather than being made by people, given A, the audio evidence, B, the fact that most of these structures are not the sort that people tend to make, and C, the fact that they are the sort of things people see throughout North America in the exact areas where Sasquatch are also seen by eyewitnesses. In other words, my process is not 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's more like 0.95 plus 0.95 equals 1.9, and I'm okay with rounding up to 2. Very well said, Christopher. You can find Christopher Noel on YouTube at Impossible Visits. All the cameras didn't work. It just changed how they approached my house. And, uh, and, uh, that's when I had to make a difficult decision, man. I was, uh, it was after New Year's. I want to say it was January 1st, January 2nd. The kids were fixing to have to go back to school. They were out for Christmas break. I mean, I remember being in the bathroom and just, it's my Bigfoot Evidence Research Center, man. I said, I did a lot of soul searching and evidence uh, evaluation sitting on that toilet back there in that bathroom, man. It's just like one of the few spots where you get a, away from all the kids and stuff and got the doors locked. Uh, and uh, I remember being back there around January 1st, January 2nd uh, in the bathroom and uh, having to come to that hard realization that everything we were trying with the cameras, with the sensors, with the 
talking to him, asking him to leave, all this different stuff was not working. We just shot at him. And they were, you don't know their intention. Personally, through all this, I believe they're truly just curious, but you just don't know. And you can't put your trust fully in that, no matter how many times people tell you that, because your kids are involved. And I remember being in there crying in the bathroom, man. I was very upset because I was fixing, I was having to make myself admit to myself that I could not stop this. The, the intensity of the activity was, was very, very intense. This was the peak. And I made the hard decision, man, that I had to get my family out of there until I could put more secure, until I felt safer about them returning. Till I had more answers, till I had more security measures, till I felt like that they were more protected, till I could make this stuff stop, whatever. And I remember, man, coming out of that bathroom, my wife was standing by the island in our kitchen, and I walked in there. And I told her, you're going to have to go stay at your mom's. I think you need to go stay at your mom's with the kids. And fortunate enough, we bought a 2000, you know, something, whatever. We had a, a camper that we bought just prior to my son's experience in October and put it at her family specifically for us to stay in when we come down there to visit. Um, so we'd have our own personal space, you know, we, we go down there and visit our in-laws. And, man, I love, I love her mom and her dad and uh, nothing but respect for them. And, um... It was a hard decision, and I remember my wife was a little bit taken back by it at first because I don't think she saw me admitting that or saying that. But I mean, it's one of those times you just got to swallow your pride and uh, put your pride aside and uh, don't take chances with your kids. It's time to it's time for, for y'all to go stay, and I didn't know how long. I thought, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be as long as it was. Um, she called her mom. And uh, I loaded them up and took them down there. Man, man, I cried all the way back to Oklahoma. And my in-laws, my mom-in-law and father-in-law, they knew that what I've been talking about, they didn't, they didn't you know, necessarily believe it. Hell, my own parents didn't believe it until I caught footage of it. And they're like, I never forget what my mom said. She's like, oh my gosh. She's like, when I caught the shadow with the creatures behind the leaning tree, that really changed it for my mom. She's like, I can't believe they're real. She said, Mark, it's not that we didn't believe you. We believed you believed, but we just didn't believe ourselves. And it changed everything for everybody. And uh, it was a very hard time, man, because I felt like my father-in-law didn't necessarily believe that I was dropping them off for that reason because it does look kind of strange it does seem peculiar that you're dropping off your wife and your kids and you're leaving them in another state while you return to Oklahoma alone and it's like you hear people of like dad's just backing out abandoned and all of a sudden dad got it left and never went to get a loaf of bread and never come back. You know, you hear stuff like this and like, you know, we have some honorary kids. <laughs> There's a reason why all my videos are shot outside or somewhere else because man, you could never shoot a video with my kids in the house. I promise you that. And it was like, almost like that feeling in the air that, that they thought I was abandoning my family. And it wasn't the case. And I, I sit there and I tell people a lot of times, man, I don't care what, I don't care if you believe me or not, but I'll tell you right now, when it comes to my in-laws, it does matter to me whether or not they believe me or not. And it did a lot right then it, that they had their doubts. And uh, and I do care what they think, uh, probably more than anybody else. And um, I never forget that, I never forget when I got home and I opened up that door of that house and it was dead silence. And man, anybody that's got young kids, small house there's never a moment of silence maybe in the middle of the night for a little bit but i had never walked inside that house and heard that silence before and it stood out it was deafening to me it just was so hit me in the in the face man that it was so silent in there and a house that had so much life 
some kids, the activity, the cartoons always playing on TV. I can't tell last time I watched a TV show. That thing auto tunes to every cartoon automatically. And for to be no life, man, it really hit me. And I became very bitter towards this Bigfoot thing. And uh, I uh, I become I become more aggressive about it. If if it don't leave, I'm gonna make it bleed. I mean, I, I really, and uh, I, uh, but the activity stopped when the kids left. Quit, nothing, like a light switch. They gone, quit. Wow, man. I mean, Mark Copeland. Crazy, and it's, and what's so cool about it is this is the end. This is it, no moss. Well, you don't really get a good feel for it, and I hope we bring it across, you know, good enough to seeing the area and the property and uh, and just the places that these things can get. And you're just, you're not going to see them. There's just no way, especially if you're not looking for them here. And I think once he became, once he became aware is when it got to be stressful. For, especially for because of his kids. Oh, obviously. without a doubt. I mean, there's there's so many. It's almost like they're strategically placed cedar trees, where even in the winter time, and they're grouped together, they can hide, right. and get a view of the house. And in walking around the area, we saw a lot of places that you wouldn't think looking from the house, but where they're almost little forts set up that have enough brush in front of them, that when there aren't leaves, they they can be viewed. And there's a lot of those places. Well, talking to Mark and him talking about finding, you know, hearing those tree breaks and then going out and actually finding where they are. But if you go outside of this perimeter, you don't find a lot of that stuff. It's mostly right up just around within a hundred foot radius of the house itself. You know, this is, this is Sasquatch Central right here. Um, the Squatch team, Bill and Sheila Tucker, we, we did their episode five miles from here. So this could be the very same plan that they had been dealing with there in episode eight uh, that we did of Bigfoot Odyssey. This could be the same plan. And from what I gather from Bill and Sheila, they don't have continuous interactions there either. It's a certain time of year. So I'm just wondering if they're not making the circuit. Like a mountain lion. You know, they say like every 30 days, a mountain lion will recircle its territory. And it's... You know, it's, it's, I go back to the cedar trees. I mean, there's so many places, even when the, when the, as seen this place, when the trees drop their leaves, you think, oh, you'll be able to pick them out. But I mean, right by where the kids play, they can be right in the middle of the cedar trees. And it's just the activity of broken stuff, like what you said, within a hundred yards. It's just evident all the way around this property. Well, they were able to, to avoid him and fool him when he was looking for them, you know, oh, yeah. you know, the whole, the thing with the shadow that you guys saw with it, you know, passing in front of the, the light, he just put his head down for a second. That's when that thing moved. Like it's following his gaze. It knew exactly when to move. Well, and like when he said he was, he was, when he first encountered him and he got his, it's like one knew when he was about to, he was watching the trigger finger because it just moved immediately when he was even thinking about firing. And he was only shooting up in the air. So it's these, uh, it just makes you wonder if they just pattern and pattern and pattern the people or the land where they are at that time, knowing what they do, how they do it, you know, their tendencies. So, but, but the other thing that's interesting is, is when you see it on film versus being here, you know, because initially on film it looked like it was a more wide open area where it's right. really not. Yeah, there's the two pastures. Is about is as open as it gets. Now the driveway is a lot more open than I thought when he talked about uh, his son and being being afraid to walk down because there was a man in the woods that would follow him. Well, it, it starts to open up a little bit more, but right there in the beginning, those woods are right there. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. and I'm sure that's what he was talking about was that. Oh well, yeah. D Sims, Miss Lady in the Woods, she came to see us. And we actually got a segment with her, so you guys can check this out. When when did you guys move here? Uh, two weeks ago. I think it was two weeks ago. It might not even been two weeks yet. 
but when we first got to the property and he started showing us around, I walked off by myself and let my husband talk to the realtor. And we were doing that, the first thing that happened when I got out of the truck and told him I was gonna go for a walk is we heard a tree knock. Now the realtor is the same realtor that was on the other property in Tallahena. And so when he heard the tree knock, he spun around and I started laughing. I said, well, they're here <laughs> because the tree knocks are unmistakable. Single knock? Or? Single knock, you know, just a nice crack. And so, of course, I don't spin around when they knock. I just wave, you know, and I kept walking. And I walked all the way around and, and just went through all the, these little pods of trees everywhere and spaces in between them that are clear. It's beautiful. Great places for them to hide, all kinds of places. They can get really close or they can stay really far. But it doesn't matter where you walk, they've got a pod of trees that they can hide in. So it's really cool. But I went walking around. I saw plenty of sign. There's tree bends and, and X structures, which I've taken people on my, you know, lives or on my videos. I've taken them back there and shown them some of the stuff. And tracks. I don't look for tracks. People that know me know that. I don't ever look on the ground. My head's always up. I'm always looking around because I, you know, it's not that I'm out there searching for them. It's just I'm, a, I'm aware. You've got bear out there, you've got hog out there, you've got big cats out there, and it's an area I've never been in, so I'm my head's on a swivel. Ever any thought of not acknowledging them when you hear those things? No, because I've been around them now so long and they've been fairly friendly, so I kind of recognize when they do certain things. And I, they might be different in different areas, you know. I mean, maybe these guys down here are a little different than the ones up in Tallahena or the ones in Arkansas or the ones in Finley where we used to, you know, where Boo was. They could be different, but I treat them all the same. I don't, I don't act any differently any place I go. But you haven't been here long enough, really, to make any kind of distinction. Uh-uh. Although I was just telling Brad, on the way, when we first got here, what was really cool is there's a little teeny bridge that you can go over, and on the bridge was a rock with a little rock next to it. And I said, that's kind of cool because it just stands out. You know, I mean, why is there a rock sitting there? On the way out today to come here, there was about 17 rocks. They're just piled up all over each other, and there was probably six or seven or eight of them stacked nice and neatly on top of each other. Any chance that's somebody? Could be. Any people around that area? Yeah. But why would they stack rocks when all the people around there say they don't believe in them? Right. I mean, I just thought it was funny that there was only two rocks, and all of a sudden there's a whole bunch. You know, I think that's interesting. I'm not saying it's 100% Sasquatch, and I'm not saying, oh my gosh, I know that's what it is, but you know, it's a fun part. You right. know, because if you pay attention, that's why my head's always on a swivel. If you pay attention to the stuff around you, you'll see those subtle differences that can, you know, just kind of add to what I already know about being with them. Aside from knobs, what about things that are not so subtle? Any notable experiences since you've been here? Hmm. And I had tapping on the window last night. I don't get any, I never, I haven't had any smell except for when we were in Finley that night that Boo chased off whatever he chased off. It's the only time we ever smelled anything. I don't get any kind of smells. Um, we've seen eye shine. I can hear whistles. I can hear, there's so many coyotes around there. I'm not, I'm not distinguishing the difference between the coyotes. They just sound like coyotes. There's a lot of cows around there, so you hear cows all night long. So I don't really pay much attention until it's distinct. When it's distinct and I in here know that's what it is, then I pay attention. Otherwise, I just ignore it. Window tapping, what, what, what happened there? Well, that was really funny. My husband, last night, he had his headphones on because that's we can't, both can't watch movies or something on our computers if we, have the, you know, if we don't have headphones on. So he's sitting there, and all of a sudden we heard it sounded like the coolers, because we have three coolers sitting right outside the door. And it sounded like one of the coolers was opened and closed. And he grabs his, you know, side of the, the headset, and he pulls it back. He goes, did you hear that? And I said, yeah, there's something right outside. So he gets up real quick and gets his flashlight, opens the door, and there's nothing there. And so he closes the door and sits down. He puts his headphones back on. I'm listening, and now I'm hearing noises out there. Dogs are silent. If it had been a raccoon, a skunk, a deer, anything but a bear, because my dogs aren't used to bears. So to them, that'd be a major predator. But, <clears throat> or something that they haven't ever come across, so they'd be quiet, you know, but normally they're just barking at everything. And plus we have the two small puppies now, so they'll bark at anything. 
But anyways, we start hearing some noise out there, and I'm going, I'm tapping, you know, on the table, and he looks at me, and I point like this, and he goes, I hear it. And I said, there's something out there. Well, I told him, I said, don't go out, because if it's a skunk, and you scare it, <laughs> we only have this little teeny tiny living space, and it's going to smell really bad. Well, anyway, so he goes out again, takes his headlamp, goes outside, looks all over the place. He said he has to go out to the back, you know, which that's where he goes to the bathroom. He was back in a second, and I said, boy, that was quick. And he said, mm, he goes, I'm not comfortable out here. And I said, why? And I said, something's staring at you? He goes, yeah, something's staring at me. He goes, I just got that feeling. So we come back in, and he, you could, I can tell, because I have my headphones on too, but his, whatever he's watching is louder. I mean, I can hear it with my headphones on. It was funny. And all of a sudden, I heard, then he stops. He's chewing on something, and he looks at me, and I went, he goes, that was the window. And I said, yeah, that's the window. He goes, skunk can't touch the window. <laughs> I got the biggest kick out of that, because the look on his face is just priceless. He's, he never believed in any of this in the beginning. He just thought this, he'd roll his eyes at me when I started mentioning all the stuff and all the activity that I had up there in Finley with Boo, until, you know, he had his first vocal, actually. And then the night that Kevin from Glag Series, when he was up there visiting, and Denny and I, the three of us were all armed, and we were facing every open opening in that RV because whatever was running around that RV scared my husband so bad that he grabbed that. He wanted, I had the, and I gave him my judge. And I said, because he's never shot. And I said, I gave him the judge because it's easy. And uh, we spun around, the three of us, and it was like, 20, 30 minutes of this howling, screaming, god-awful, I got goosebumps right now. It was horrifying, and I'd never heard anything like that in my life. And you could hear the footfall, which I thought was Boo, and I tell everybody I think it was Boo, chase this thing around because you could hear it scream, and then you could hear the heavy footfall, and then you could hear this, you know, gruff, real gruff noise, and then you could hear it getting further and further and further away, and I even have that on one of my videos on audio. You could hear it. It was horrifying. We, we didn't go back. We went back to pick up the RV and get it off the property, but we didn't go back. I couldn't stay up there anymore. I don't know what it was, but it terrified me. It was horrible. But anyway, going back to... Denny now believes, now he wants to see one. You know, like I said, right now he's home playing with a parabolic mic, and if I had a camera out there for him, he'd be out there tonight with night vision or something. He's really interested now. Are you gonna make the same efforts here as you did there to try to get to know this clan? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And if they start giving me grief, I'll give grief back. You know, if they start throwing stuff, I'll throw stuff back. You know, I don't, you know, I treat them like teenagers. That's what I believe. I don't. I think that's the cap of their mentality is a teenage mentality. I mean, mentality, honestly. And that's how I treat them, like a teenage kid. You know, I mean, if you're gonna be mean to me, I'll ignore you. You know, just go away. And that's how I'll treat them. But yeah, I'll go out there. I did put peanuts out. I don't usually do stuff like that. But I put peanuts out in a bag, and they haven't touched it. They did grab one of the marbles. One of two. I left two up there and I put one inside the pocket of a piece of bark the bark was still there the one in the pocket of the bark is missing that was a blue one and the other one's sitting right there which should have fallen with wind or rain or something knocking it that should have fallen but the one that was in the pocket's gone and they left the apple sitting there so so I know this is good it's gonna be fun and one thing that the D she also talked about thinking it was a clan that moves around because yeah. she thinks it's a lot of the same or the same ones that visit her and then visit the Tuckers. Yeah, well, she just lives about 15 minutes from here. She's she, not far down the road at all. And she was not far at all when her place flooded as well. Right. So. right. And we, I know she was getting some good activity there. But uh, how, what about David Wilbanks? I mean, how awesome was that? I thought it was really cool because he just brings a different perspective and he's been doing it for what 20 plus years yeah and I got David's book and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about that right now well I've been working on a nonfiction book which is an account of um, 
different investigations into this subject that I've done over the past 20 plus years. And writing a nonfiction book's a little more complicated if you want to do it right. Like you don't run people's stories without getting permission from them. Right. Ever. You know, and I'm very of that. So you wouldn't take someone's email that they sent you and just throw it in a book willy-nilly without saying Not, nilly, not hey, unless email. I contacted them and they said, oh, absolutely. Right. I've got loads of reports and emails of reports that people send me. They say, hey, this is for your database. We'd rather you not use it on your YouTube right. channel. I don't. You don't want to break trust with people. Sure. And I mean, I wouldn't do that anyway. But um, so anyhow, I had an idea for a fictional story. And I wanted to base it on, a, I think, the Genesis. Uh, one, I'd had a dream. And I'd, I guess I'd gone to bed thinking about Bigfoot stuff. And in the dream, I was walking down a, a dark wooded path. And it's funny how when you're in a dream, it could be pitch black, but you still see stuff. Right. You know, and I looked up into the woods, and there's this face looking back at me. And I woke up, for some reason, I started writing. So, and I'm like going, well, what kind of mean Bigfoot is down in this part of the country? And I come up with the title for the book called The Champagne. Now, the reason I focused on that is where I live, and in this part of the country, this is Choctaw territory, which borders on Chickasaw territory. Now, the Choctaw had the uh, uh, legend of the Champe, which that's the title of my book. It's available on Amazon, by the way, an e-book or, uh, or paperback. And it is, uh, according to their folklore, it goes all the way back to, to your home state of Mississippi, and it described a large, foul-smelling, ogre-like monster that lived in the swamp. And they don't call it a Bigfoot. Obviously, however many hundred years ago that come from, they didn't know what that was. But uh, it would follow somebody if they crossed into their territory, and it would kill them and eat them. So it falls into, and I know you've done considerable research in this as well. Most of the tribes I, that I know of have some legend about a cannibal giant, whether it's the Sonequa up in the, you know, Pacific Northwest. You got the Champe from Mississippi, um, the, uh, the Stone Giants, stuff like that. You can go on and on, as well as they have their legends about the large hairy. Uh, they, I don't know any tribal tribe that thinks they're monkeys. Okay, that's a whole other conversation you and I've had. We don't think they're monkeys. I don't. Um, but anyway. I tied the story into the legend of Champe and placed the story taking place in the Washita Mountains here in southeast Oklahoma. And I tied in with the, uh, I mix it with my research. It's a fictional book, but the things that I'm saying about your, what we know is just your average Bigfoot, the shy giant of the woods that pretty much wants to stay away from us, is things that I've gathered from my research. There's a funny thing that happened that does not um, have anything to do with Bigfoot and when you read that part you'll know it's about some campers that I witnessed firsthand and just had to put it in the book somewhere now there are when I'm recounting uh, some Bigfoot sightings in there there are two of those that are based on uh, actual uh, events that I've researched and been a part of but they're not verbatim and he also has a YouTube channel that's called uh, Bigfoot and more where he talks about people's stories and uh, and puts those things on there. But uh, there was a story going around, that I've heard it for a long time, this casino video. Oh yeah, yeah. Where they there's this dumpster and they're catch a Bigfoot coming to it, doing some stuff. Well, David actually saw the video. So here's him talking about that. This casino video where, and this is just the way I've heard this story, okay. okay? This eight to 10 foot tall Sasquatch comes into this dumpster, grabs some trash out of it, and leaves, and they got it on camera, and they called in Fish and Game, and they took the evidence away so nobody else could see it. Now, can you shed a little bit of uh, truth on this video because I know you, you were there. You shed all the truth on Okay, do that for us. And uh, really the only part of what you said is as accurate is they did have a film of this 8 to 10 foot tall creature come up to cut. No dumpster. It was not a dumpster. It was a grease trap. Okay. 
uh, in the, the videos just a few seconds. I was doing some volunteer field work for a, uh, another organization at that time, uh, very briefly, but also with a gentleman uh, named uh, Roger Roberts, and uh, he was a private investigator up in Tulsa. And we got the call on that. I arrived at this uh, area, and I'm not going to say the name of the, the tribe. It's tribal property, and I, you know they obviously don't want to be bothered with it. But I, I arrived there earlier in the day and went and looked up the individual that I was told to find. And then Roger arrived uh, later in the evening with a friend of his. I don't know his friend's name. I didn't know him, but Roger brought him along. Now, outside of tribal employees, unless something changed later, me, Roger, and his friends were the only one that seen this video. Okay, now here's uh, what it showed. And it, like I say, it was, only, it was a few seconds is all. But uh, the first thing you notice on it, and if you've ever seen like a surveillance video or not, it's kind of grainy, uh, kind of a greenish look to it. But what you notice at first, it looks like a glow, okay? But now here's where me and Roger perceived this part a little different, and it's neither here nor there. His perception was that glow was eye shine. Personally, I thought it was the reflection of that, uh, uh, what do you call it, street lamps, mercury lamps, kind of reflecting off the hair on top of its head. It might have been eye shine of that. But anyway, what you notice first is that slight glow, and then it almost just looks like it materializes. I mean, it's, it don't, it just walks more fully into the frame. And it takes two or three steps and leans forward towards the top of this grease trap. That's all that's in the video. Now, what did it look like? It wasn't, um, from my recollection, real bulky. Uh, the term I always used to describe it at the time, I was like going, well, imagine a, an NBA basketball player, real tall and lanky, kind of muscular, covered in hair. That's kind of what this looked like. Now, as far as the height, we were able to go out there and measure because this street lamp was about 10 foot tall okay and it had a an arm that came over the the grease trap here and measuring up that we measured it just over nine feet tall so and we re, they rewind it for us rewind for us rewind it and i'm just and the thing that went in my head was i'm like well you know i've always been interested in this all my life but i remember saying they really are real <laughs> because how many nine plus fit people do you know that, and the way it moved, I mean, and here's where when you see reenactments of Bigfoot sightings, they're usually lumbering, they look like a monster, this thing moved like a liquid. I mean, it just, it was just there, you know, and, and that was it, it leaned forward, that's all that's in the video. Um, and that's actually what I was hearing, stuff like what you recounted, I was seeing that on the internet, and that's actually what inspired me first to start a YouTube channel. I thought, you know, I'm going to make a video saying what I've seen there. Then I started having fun uh, recollect, uh, telling the stories of people's accounts that had given to me from way back and just kept going with it. But um, it, the deal about it being a dumpster, and Keep in mind, I'm not saying that there's not a video out there somewhere of a dumpster that a Sasquatch gets into, but the video that we've seen, it's not a dumpster. Now, a grease trap looks like a dumpster, but on the top of it, it's got a small square lid kind of in the middle where they'd raise it up and put the grease in. But there, there was nothing grabbing trash bags out of it and running off with it, not on that. That's not me saying there doesn't exist a video like that somewhere, but that's not the casino footage. And, and I think what's really fascinating is how the story was Bigfoot went into a dumpster and pulled out trash bag, where in fact it was a, a grease trap. Right. And with the height of the grease trap, they were able to really pretty concisely estimate how, how big this one was. Well, it's just proof of how stories get changed as they go along. Oh, yeah. You know, someone hears something or overhears something, and, and it changes a little bit from, from this person telling it to the next person telling it. And this was a long time ago when they right. did this, but it was good. It was good to get the actual story and the validation of that. And he actually has a lot of his his research, and gets a lot of people calling him in this area to check out what they've seen and, and inquire about it, and ask him what he thinks. And and he's one thing that I like about him is that he keeps when they say don't say anything, you know, he keeps it private. Yeah. And, and and I respect that a lot. Well, we had a really good trip. 
Um, Brad, thank you so much for coming up here with me and and Phil producing and helping out. And it's uh, I just can't thank you enough for doing that. Well, uh, it, it's been so much fun and so much fun watching you actually do this because I've seen the final product. The final product gets better with every one, but to now actually see how you do it is, is pretty cool. I mean, no, I, I didn't think it'd be anything like, like it was, really? but it, it was pretty cool. I enjoyed it. I, I actually learned something. Can't believe that. No. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> but no, hey, but it was good. But hey, you can check out me and Brad every Friday night and Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Central for The Late Show. We have people with experiences on. We have uh, people with uh, researchers like to come on and talk about their stuff. But uh, it's a live show, a lot of good camaraderie in the chat, and um, just we have a great time with it. And also, don't forget to check out Hidden Existence, a show with my other co-host and producer of the Bigfoot Odyssey Researchers Report that we do on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Central with Daniela Aiolo, her channel, Hidden Existence. Uh, make sure you go and check that out. Great stuff there. So you'll be able to find links to all that in the description. Uh, big shout out and thanks to everyone that's donated to help us do this show. Um, it couldn't have done it without you, absolutely. So pat yourselves on the back for that. Um, and we do greatly appreciate all that. Thank you all so much. Brad, it's been awesome. It has been fun. All right. Now back to COVID. Let's get back out of here. You got it. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoy it. Well, there's things there in the night Would make a grown man die from fright so many things it's all so clear something just ain't right when it's too hard to ignore you gotta open up that door and take some time to try and find the truth that lies in store in your big foot out of sea in your big foot out of sea your big full odyssey and you can choose not to believe but the truth is out there waiting and it's up to you to see